Hey everyone, my name is Rachel and I thought I would try something a little bit different today with my video and I'd like to talk to you about one of my kind of big loves and passions in life and that is photography. I don't know how much you guys know about me and kind of my past and things I've done. Um, I used to work in digital marketing but over the years I've also done lots of little bits of freelance work working in photography but mostly it's just been a big hobby and a passion of mine. Mostly I do shoot digital, I have my pretty old now but a Canon 550D and I have another little kind of point and shoot camera that I use and I sometimes shoot on my iPhone now for convenience. My favourite thing to photograph are gigs and concerts and live music. That's what I'm best at, that's what I love, that's where I find the excitement and I love it. But another big big passion of mine which is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from gig photography really is film photography. When you're shooting a gig everything is so fast, you've got to think in the moment, you've just got to act impulsively, you've got to understand your camera completely, you've just got to go for it and try and get that shot, you've got one chance and if you miss it, you miss it. And in a lot of ways film photography is entirely the opposite but also entirely the same. You do still get that excitement because you only get one chance with it, because you've only got 24 or 36 frames, sometimes only 12 frames. You do get that excitement and that feeling that you know you get one shot at this, but instead of being quick and impulsive, you do still need to understand your camera like completely and thoroughly, but instead of it being kind of instinctual, you you put a little bit more thought into it and a little bit more time into composing your photos, into getting the right settings, into thinking about it. I find film photography is a very kind of thoughtful experience and it's quite relaxing but still exciting and fun and I like that. But anyway, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's kind of start back at the beginning. So when I talk about film photography, I'm talking about shooting with film like this, negatives. Um, this is a pretty old fashioned thing now. Not a lot of people shoot film anymore because to be honest, you know, you get 12 or 24 or 36 shots on a roll of film. Compared to digital, it's very expensive and it's not as convenient. And you know, very few places now actually develop film. So, it's not the easiest kind of hobby to get into. Even getting film cameras now can be very difficult and most of mine I either um, kind of bought from weird little vintage shops or weird little retro film camera shops or I bought second hand from charity shops or eBay or something like that. Um, anyway, basically the plan is for today's video. I'm going to try introducing film photography a little bit and explaining why I love it so much. I'm going to show you my cameras and then show you a few of my photos and then, I don't know, just open up discussion a little bit, I guess. I don't really have much of a plan, I just thought I'd make it up as I go along. I just kind of gathered my cameras around me and figured something would happen. <laughs> so when it comes to the actual film itself, these are what we call negatives. This is a film that has been through a camera and it's been processed and you've got photographs on film out the other side, right? You kind of have three basic types of film. You have black and white negative, colour positive, which is also known as slide film, and colour negative. Colour negative is by far the most popular, the most common, but black and white negative came first, and black and white slides, and so on. There's, there's a whole history there, it's very very interesting, but I don't want to kind of go into it too much. Each of those types of films needs processing in a different way with different chemicals at different temperatures with a different process. I shoot a mix of colour negative and black and white negative. Mostly colour negative now that I've left university and don't have access to my own darkroom anymore, but I did used to develop my own film by hand and print photos by hand using an enlarger. Um, kind of like you see in old films and stuff, you know, with the red light and that was what I used to do, it was so much fun. You also have different sizes of films. The most common film by far is 35mm. You normally get 24 to 36 shots on a roll of film. Um, it's very, very easy to change the film. The canisters are very convenient. You know, you can change your canisters in the light and stuff, which is why it became one of the most popular. For a while, APS films were also quite common. 
and um, they were kind of very automatic and they kind of wound the film out and wound it back in all automatically so that was popular for a while but for the t kind of photography I do it's not really appropriate none of my cameras take APS. The other size film that I shoot is 120 which are these big big films quite wide and um, depending on the camera you can either get really cool big portrait photos or really cool square photos or really massive landscape photos. Basically you use this film with slightly different cameras, you do get better image quality, it's sometimes known as medium format so you might have heard of it like that um, and it's just a really fun little alternative to 35mm and I enjoy shooting both depending on what I'm doing really. This is just an example of a 35mm film as you get it in the box. So this is a black and white negative film and basically when it arrives you take it out of the box and it's in a little, little tube here and the film itself is wound in a canister like this and you get this little end bit here uh, that is poking out and as soon as this is exposed to light basically a chemical reaction happens again the process is very very interesting but I don't want to go into too much detail here and depending on how much light hits the film in what places how long it's exposed for and so on that's basically how you get the picture on the film then you develop it and you end up with negatives a bit like this and then from this you can use these to print an actual photograph like these and I love printing my photographs. I used to work in a photo lab when I was like 14, well, between the ages of 14 and 18, and I adored it. And that was kind of when my interest in photography started peaking. And that was when I started developing my own films and printing my own photos. And I've absolutely like loved it ever since. I feel like we're living in a time now when, and oh, I'm gonna sound like such a little hipster here, I'm sorry, but we are living in a time where people take more photos than ever but we don't really appreciate them the same because you don't really put the same time and effort into taking the photos and you don't put the same time and effort into going back and looking at those memories and that's one of the reasons why I love to get my photos printed so much so I can go back and look at the memories and think about them and also I like to make scrapbooks hang on one second so I've got two random little examples here of scrapbooks that I've made and I absolutely adore these. I love making scrapbooks. I love like crafty little bits as well and doing this is like one of those things that really lets me look back through my photographs and remember the good times and I do make some like this one of me and Dan from our first holiday together where it's more just about the memories and me and him and having fun and just I love looking back at them and me and Dan sometimes sit here and be like we go through these and I'm like oh remember when we did this and remember when this happened and stuff and yeah, this one's not really so much of an arty book, but it was just a memory book that me and Dan, well, that I put together for Dan for, I think it was his birthday. Um, this one, on the other hand, was from my holiday to Barcelona when I went with Photosoc, the Photography Society at Warwick. And this one is definitely more of a kind of artsy one, it's more of a memory one. I put these little note cards in of like what we did on each day and I put in little extra bits like um, business cards from places we'd been and tickets and little maps and stuff and so on and yeah I just I love making things like this but the point is that even when I'm not shooting film I still like to get my photos printed and um, because I think they're brilliant for memories and looking back at all those amazing times and just I love it I love it, sorry! <laughs> now I figured I'd go through and just show you a few of my cameras. I'm going to try and do something a little bit kind of different today where I'm going to talk about my cameras now on camera and then when I go back and do my editing magic I'm going to intersperse me talking now with close-up shots of my cameras showing you them in a little bit more detail. Yeah? Clever, right? I think the best thing would be to start with don't tell the others, but start with my favourite. This is the film camera that I shoot more than anything, and this is my little, very well-loved Olympus OM-10. I'm not sure if I have film in here, actually. I do, I do. So if you wind this on and you feel resistance, there's the film in, basically. Um, I'm 
Oh, okay, I'm nine shots into the roll, so I can't open this one up for you and show you, unfortunately. Um, but just know, it's very cool inside. So if you take the little lens cap off, on here I've got a 50mm 1.8 lens, which means you get a really big aperture, so it's really good for use in low light, because I only ever use 200 or 400 ASA film, which basically means how sensitive it is to light, and the lower the number, the less sensitive. And it can go up to like 3200, so... So I've got a 50mm 1.8 lens on here, which does give you a very narrow depth of field, good for low light, and the 50mm is really nice for portraits, and it's just quite a nice sort of general use lens, I find, for kind of everyday stuff in terms of film photography. So the Olympus LM10 is an aperture priority camera, which means I can set the aperture size on here, the ASA or the light sensitivity is set by the film, but I don't have control over the shutter speed, which is why I bought this clever little adapter on it, which is right here. Um, I literally got this adapter for a fiver from a little shop in Brighton called Snoopers Paradise. Um, I love that place, it's amazing. I used to go there all the time when I lived down in Brighton. The camera itself I got for like £15 off eBay, so this whole thing was very, very cheap to get started with, and it's just a really great little versatile camera. And I also have the bonus of, where is it, a second lens which my old personal tutor from Warwick Uni gave me. David, I love him so much. He is the nicest, loveliest guy and he gave me a bunch of his old film cameras and lenses and stuff. And one of them was a 75 to 150mm lens, which is a really nice telescopic lens, good for long distance, um, and also it just it looks very chunky. Actually, I've not had much of a chance to play with this, um, but from what I have, it's very fun. And I do like it. So this kind of camera is what's known as an SLR, or a single lens reflex. And basically what you have is a lens on the front, a mirror inside, and that literally projects the image up into the viewfinder. So essentially, when you look through the viewfinder, what you're seeing through there is how your picture's gonna come out in terms of framing, right? Which is why something like an SLR I find is really, really good for beginners, because you don't have to kind of overthink it too much. It does a lot of stuff, it's a very good kind of tool for learning with. Another SLR that I have is this little Practica camera. Again, this is one of the ones that David gave me. Um, this one I don't actually have a film in, so I can open it up and show you inside. This one is actually fully, fully manual, so obviously you set your ASA or light sensitivity with the film that you're using. You set your aperture size on the lens, which is a 50mm f2.8 lens, and you set your shutter speed up here on this little dial. So to open it up, you literally lift up this little sort of tab here, and it pops open, and you can see inside. So if you are buying a second-hand film camera, really important things to look for to make sure there's no rusting inside this area here, make sure there's no mold or fungus growth, because that can be very, very common in older cameras, especially if they've been stored in damp places. Uh, you also want to look how kind of smoothly this shutter opens and closes. So if you make sure it's wound on and hit the shutter, you'll be able to see it open and close. Wind it on again. You want to also make sure the winding mechanism is really, really smooth. Yeah, if I set this to say like a bulb shutter speed, which means the shutter stays open for as long as I hold the shutter down basically, you'll be able to see down into the lens. And what you want to do at this point is look down kind of, let me see if I can show you on camera, there you go. Look straight down through the lens, make sure there's no fungus or mold growing on the lens, make sure it's clear, make sure there's no scratches, um, just to make sure it's in good condition really. So when you put your film in the camera, the film stretches across here and when you open the shutter, this kind of opens up, exposes the film to light for a few seconds and then you roll it on and the next piece of film comes as a little shutter. It's as simple as that. This is a cute basic little camera. It's not too different from my Olympus OM10 to be honest, but sometimes it's nice to have two similar cameras because I can put two different films in each one and take them both out with me. Different films can also have different colour temperatures, so if I want one film with a more kind of yellow warmer shoe and another film in black and white, or I want another film with bluer, cooler tones, or I want one film with high contrast, or I want one film that's a little bit kind of like noisier and grainier. Um, there's, there's different things you can play around with depending on what kind of effect you want on the photos afterwards. 
final one to talk about would be this little guy who is very dusty and I don't really use him, I just kind of keep him more for sentimental reasons now because he was another one that David gave me. And um, This is an Olympus OM1, so it's a lot more manual than the OM10. It does have an inbuilt shutter speed control and this has a 50mm 1.4 lens on it, which is pretty cool. The only problem with this is that there is a little bit of mould growing inside. Thankfully it's not damaged the lens I don't think, so I should be able to switch this lens out and use it on my OM10 because, like I say, bigger shutter, narrower depth of field with the 1.4 over the 1.8. But same focal length, so not too much of a difference to be honest. Then I have this little guy who I don't really know too much about. I picked him up for like £7 in a charity shop. It takes 35mm film. I'll open it up and show you inside. This is what it looks like. I don't have an actual date for this, but I think, looking at it, it's from around the 70s, maybe mid-70s, early 80s, something like that. It's a lot more basic than an SLR. So when you look through the viewfinder, it literally shows you what's coming out of this front little kind of opening here. It doesn't actually connect to the lens at all, which means that your framing can sometimes be a little bit off depending on where you're looking, how close you are to the subject and so on. The other thing is with things like focusing, you're not always quite as accurate. With this, you kind of just have to have your best guess. So with the Olympus OM10, as you move the lens to focus it, because this is directly kind of connected to the viewfinder, you can see when an image is in focus. You know whether it's in focus or not based on what you're looking at through here. With this, there's no connection. So you just have to judge it as best you can based on the distance. And you literally get little icons in here that are either like, landscape, far away, headshots, close up. And you just have to kind of guess as best you can. And because the aperture is bigger, is a lot more forgiving because the depth of field isn't quite as narrow. That said, I do still get control over the shutter speed and aperture size here on the lens, so you do get a lot of control like that. And your little shutter is down here, which is quite cute, as in a different little place. Technically, in terms of like being advanced and technical and all that stuff, not the best camera, but in terms of fun, yeah, it's a good laugh, I enjoy using it. Next up we have my oldest camera in my collection, this, which is a little Zeiss Icon Netar camera. I wish I could show you this inside from the back because it's really really cool but it does have a film in at the minute. This camera is from around the mid 1920s, potentially early 1930s and I really hope you just saw that coming out on the bellows there because I think this is so cute. Watch, you press one button and boop! it pops out on bellows. I love this. I love this so much. So this takes 120 film, so it's a lot bigger. You can see the little countdown on the back here. Um, it's a little bit grubby because it's been sat in a box for a while since we moved. Don't judge me. You have your focus controls on the front, you have your shutter speed, you have your aperture size on the front, and you have your shutter up here. I just think this is the coolest looking little camera. It takes really fun photos. Because it's so old, they're not perfect, and it is prone to light leaks, but that can leave you with some really cool effects on the camera. Learning to focus this was a little bit difficult, because again, you have to use your best judgement. It literally just says 4 feet, 5 feet, 6, 7, 8, up to 48 feet away. You have to kind of guess based on distance, and I'm not very good at judging distance. And um, again, to put it away, you just, these little hinges here, you just push them down, and it folds back in and clicks together. I adore this camera. It's probably my favourite little thing I've ever bought. Um, I think I think I got this one from eBay as well. I think it was maybe like £20? I'm not sure. Last up, speaking of fun and light leaks, and not really serious photos, but having a good laugh with them, we have my little toy camera collection. Toy cameras are the name given to kind of plastic cameras. They're not serious, they're not professional, but they're so much fun and I love them. The first toy camera I got is this little guy here. And this is my little Holger. My Holger takes 120 film again and is all made of plastic and he's very, very cute. The Holger is like the epitome of toy cameras. He's very simple, looks kind of bulky, but he's just so much fun. The good thing about the kind of bulk and the plastic is that it's very damage resistant. So if you do accidentally drop it, it lives a while, it's okay. Again, you kind of have to judge the focus as best you can with the settings of person, people, group of people, 
mountains. <laughs> so it's not hugely accurate like that. What is cool about this camera is that it does have a built-in flash and you have different kind of coloured flash modes as well. So you can put a blue, red or yellow filter over it which gives really cool effects. You can switch to bulb mode on this so you can control your shutter speed to that effect but not hugely and you only have two aperture size settings. Sunny or cloudy day. <laughs> so it's kind of like small aperture, medium sized aperture, that's about it. So you don't get a huge amount of control, it's not very complicated. This is very, very, very prone to light leaks, but that just kind of leads to a lot of fun and a lot of unexpectedness, and you never know what's going to come out of this camera. My other toy camera is one that was a little more expensive, um, because you are kind of paying for the look of it and the name of it as well. Um, and that is my Diana F+. Plus. So Diana's are pretty fairly well known now, which is why I think I paid about £40 for this, maybe £45. Um, but it's so gorgeous and cute and beautiful and I love it. Um, again, it uses 120 film, it's all kind of plastic, it's kind of prone to light leaks sometimes, but not as much as the Holger. Um, you've got your little shutter on the front here again, quite a loud shutter on this one. Um, you have your focus on the front here with this little ring and again this one is a little bit better because it does give you some distances so it's like at this point one to two meters is this point two to four meters and at this point four plus meters so it does give you a little bit more to go on in that respect but again I'm a terrible judge of distance so sometimes my focus is a little off. Uh, you also have more options down here in regards to the aperture size which is useful and in terms of shutter speed, you either got bulb or normal. So not a huge amount of choice there, but again, you don't really need it. It's more about just having fun and taking cool pictures with this camera and not really knowing what's gonna come out of it. As you'd expect with both of these, the viewfinder is literally just a little kind of window in the camera, so it's not linked to the lens at all, so you don't know what's really gonna come out in terms of focus range and stuff, and there's nothing like a light meter either, so you have to judge those sh settings as best you can. The final camera I want to mention is just a really, really silly, but fun little camera that my sister bought me. Um, but it looks like a robot, and it's so cute, and I love it. This is a little 35mm film camera. Everything is automatic in terms of exposure and stuff, but what's really cool about this is that the shutter, instead of being like a rolling shutter, is like a kind of twirling shutter and it actually takes three different photos at a time each within like a split second of each other which means it's really cool for getting action shots the photos that come out aren't as high quality because obviously they're smaller on the film but you get kind of like three shots at a time so if you take a picture of a person waving you might get like one two three in terms of the photo and it's just a silly little kind of gimmick it's just for a bit of fun but it's really adorable and I love it and it's really fun to play around with. So, oh, actually, no, I'm lying. My last camera I have, my last film camera, isn't built yet. This is a build your own SLR kit. And I did start making it a while back and then I got distracted with the university. And since I met Dan, he's wanted to continue building it with me. And yeah, we're both really keen to do that, but we've not had a chance yet, so I'm just going to hold this up so you can see it. Ah, but it's really, really cool. You literally get to build your own camera. It is pretty complex stuff. I had one of these in a little build your own TLR kit. TLRs are twin lens reflex cameras. And I had the cutest little thing, and I built it myself. Um, and then about two months ago, Dan accidentally knocked it off our hall table, and it broke. And I cried. <laughs> but that's okay, like, it, it wasn't his fault, it was an accident and I shouldn't have left it so close to the edge. So we're both at fault there, and the plan is eventually when we get more money I'm hopefully going to buy myself a new TLR, or rather a new second-hand TLR. I'd really like um, a nice kind of old vintage TLR. TLRs are really cool because they literally have two lenses that move and work in tandem. Um, the two lenses are, are basically exactly the same, except one of the lenses kind of links to the film and one of the lenses links to a kind of upright viewfinder and the kind of the image that it sees is kind of reflected on a little screen up to show you. 
that's also kind of how this SLR works, but with only one lens. Does that make sense? So yeah, it's a little bit difficult to explain without showing it you, and I don't have one here to show you because it broke. But yeah, my point is, it's, it's my plan to build this camera with Dan and buy a new TLR. Um, anyway, that was kind of me done talking about those cameras now, and I feel a little bit lost because I just kind of got into a zone there, and now I'm a bit like, what do I talk about next? But yeah, I don't know, maybe I thought it would be fun to end by just showing you a few of my photos I've taken over the years with these cameras. They're not my best work by any means, but I don't take film photos to be artsy or cool or like to earn money from it or whatever. I just take these photos for me and for myself and to have fun and to play around and to save some memories with. So these are literally like the kind of photos that are just for me. And I do enjoy it. I do, I do think they're really, really fun. I always find film photography is so thrilling because you can spend so long composing a shot and thinking about your camera settings and you really have to understand your camera and you really have to understand exposure and how that works and you have to understand what everything on your camera does. It's not just a matter of like point and shoot like it is with a lot of camera phones these days. Um, especially in some of these cameras which are a bit older and the light meter stopped working. On those you really have to know what you're doing in terms of what exposure will be right for this light setting or this setting or whatever. But yeah, so you, but even then you can do everything you think is right and you still don't quite know how the photo is going to come out and you might get things going wrong, like you might have light leaks or you might have something go wrong with the film or um, I don't know, any anything really, a negative might get slightly damaged in some way or whatever. So you don't quite know what's going to happen until your film's been developed and your photos have been printed and you get these back. That's the exciting thing that, oh, there's nothing better than like going to um, like a photo lab or a pharmacy or whatever and being handed back that envelope and that excitement of going through and looking at your photos for the first time. Like, I love that so, so much. It's amazing. Yeah, there's just, there's something special about the physical and completely permanent aspect of film, it feels a little bit more special than digital sometimes. And I know it's most convenient, and I know it's a lot more expensive, but I kind of love it. Yeah, anyway, I feel like I'm, I am rambling a little bit now, and this might not be of interest to some of you, and I'm sorry if it's not, but I don't know, I just kind of wanted to share something that I really love and that I'm really passionate about with you guys. And yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it or got something out of this or learnt something or you just were cool with me rambling on for a while at you, I, I don't know. <laughs> but if you have made it through this far, um, thank you so, so much for watching this video and just giving me this opportunity to talk about something I love so much like this. Uh, it has been really, really fun. And please let me know if you're interested in photography or if you use any of these cameras or if you've ever been into film photography or you've ever developed your own films or anything like that let me let me know your thoughts down in the comments please because i really do love to hear from you but for now thank you so so much for watching this and letting me do this and letting me have fun with it i really really do appreciate it and hopefully i will see you guys again soon Thank you so, so much to everyone supporting me on Patreon this month, with a special thank you to Mark Darner, Christian Berg, Jaylee Moore, Sir Michael Moore, Lockie Scott, Jaden Shepherd, and Matthew Minamar. You're all incredible. Also, check out everyone who is mentioned here on this end screen and down in the description below. You're all incredible, and thank you so, so much. I seriously could not do this without your support, and I am so grateful.